I am Misha, son of Chemosh, king of Moab, the Debonite, or Debonite, however you say it. These are the very first words that are carved into the Moabite stone, also known as the Misha Stele. Now, this is an incredibly important piece of Bible archaeology and just history in general, because it's one of the very, very first, one of the earliest extra biblical pieces of evidence showing uh, the, the truth of the Bible, proving scripture, proving the Bible. Uh, we often hear people talk about how the Bible is fantasy, the Bible is fairy tale. People are constantly coming against scripture trying to show uh, that, it's, that it's not true. And yet, if you look at scripture and we look at all of the, the, the sheer amount of Bible archaeology and, and the finds, the, the things that have been found proving scripture over and over again, it is so far beyond anything else that any other Greek mythology or Mormon weirdness or any of that other stuff that's out there, this is so far beyond that. So today, we're looking at the Moabite stone, and we're going to look at some of its history. It's really, really exciting. This is one of my favorite things to talk about in church history. I teach on church history all the time. Um, and so we're, we're going to be looking at that. Now, th this all starts with the story of Lot um, back in the early, early Bible, right? This is during the story of Abraham. Uh, Abraham and Lot, they get separated. Lot, he moves to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a very famous story. I won't go into the whole thing today. Uh, this all happens roughly between the years 2000 and 1900 BC. And this is after Abraham's famous negotiation with God, where God is trying to, uh, sorry, Abraham is trying to convince God not to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because there might be righteous people there. Um, eventually it just ends end up happening that God does destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because there were no righteous people there. And uh, Lot escapes. He goes into this cave. And in this cave, his daughters, his wife turns into the pillow, pillar of salt, blah, blah, blah. His daughters get him drunk and they sleep with him and they both get pregnant. Those two daughters, they, ha they, they have children and one has Ammi, who becomes the father of the Ammonites. And the other one gave birth to Moab. And Moab became the father of the Moabites. And the Moabites are a real, both of them, the Ammonites and Moabites, they were really, really important throughout church history. But the, the Moabites themselves, they were so key to church history um, in many ways. Uh, first of all, uh, Ruth was a Moabite, and Ruth, of course, became she was the grandmother of King David, who, of course, then became the the great great however many twelve generations to Jesus, and so the Moabites. It's amazing this people group that was born from Lot, that was born out of incest, became the uh, the what are they called the ancestors of of Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But before all of that, before um, uh, the king before Jesus came onto the scene, the Moabites they were enemies of Israel for generations, and uh, there was a point in time where the Israelites they had conquered the Moabites. The Moabites were um, a vassal state; they were enslaved, for lack of a better word. They were underneath the the rule of the Israelites, and then around the year eight hundred and. 50. So all of these things happen, right? The hundreds of years go by, and um, King David comes and goes. He dies. They He fights with them. Um, King Solomon has come and gone. Elijah had his major confrontation with Jezebel and the prophets of Baal, and then he's later taken up in the whirlwind. Jezebel gets thrown out of a window. All these things happen. Um, Ahab, her husband and puppet, had died. Elisha is ministering in the land, and this is now about the year 850 BC. So there have been 1,300 years that have passed here. And I want to read this to you. Uh, this is from 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 1, and then I'm going to read the opposing view, which is from the Misha Stele, from the Moabite stone. And it's amazing how these two, they come together and they, they coincide so perfectly with Scripture. And I might actually even jump back and forth between the two here. So it says, uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. 
And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother, for he put away the sacred pillar of Baal uh, that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel to sin. He did not depart from them. Now Misha, king of Moab, this is verse 4, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. So this was the tribute that the Moabites had to pay to the Israelites. But it, hap- but it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab, so remember Jezebel uh, and Ahab, they were the ones who fought against Elijah, that Elijah had that whole confrontation with against the prophets of Baal. So Elijah has been taken up in the whirlwind. Elisha, like I said, he is ministering in the world right now. And um, Ahab, King Ahab, the evil, evil King Ahab has died. And so now this new king has risen up. Um, uh, King Jehoram says, But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And this is what the Misha Stele, the Moabite stone, talks about. So, uh, so actually, let's jump. I'm going to jump over there. This is what the Moabite stone says. It says, I am Misha, son of Chemosh. Now, just so you know, uh, Chemosh, it was the god. He says he's the son of Chemosh, but Chemosh is not his father. Chemosh is actually the god that they worshiped, that the Moabites worshiped at that time. I am Misha, son of Chemosh, Gad, the king of Moab, the Dibonite, Dibonite. My father reigned over Moab for 30 years, and I have reigned after my father. And I have made this high place for Chemosh the, in, in Korho, a high place of salvation, because he has saved me from all kings and caused me to triumph over all my adversaries. Omri, Omri was an evil king, was the king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab many days because Chemosh was angry with his land. And his son succeeded him, and he also said, I will oppress Moab. In my days, he spoke thus, but I have triumphed over him and is over his house. And Israel has been reduced to ruin, and his people have gone. And Chemosh said to me, Go, take Nebo from Israel. So I went in the night and fought against it from the break of dawn until noon. And I took it and slew the entire population, 7,000 male subjects and aliens, female subjects and aliens, and servant girls. For I devoted them to this destruction for the god Ashtar Chemosh. And I took from there the vessels of Yahweh. This is one of the earliest, earliest um, mentions of Yahweh in history outside of the Bible. He specifically says, uh, I took from there the vessels of Yahweh and dragged them before Chemosh. And the king of Israel had fortified Jahaz, and he occupied it during this campaign against me. But Chemosh drove him out before me. So I took from Moab 200 men, all its chiefs, and I led them against Jahaz and took it in order to add it to Debon. Now the inscription, it goes on, it mentions other t- conquered cities, territories. It it's, um, continues on for quite a while. But let me read you the, the, the biblical um, account here. So it says, uh, we're starting in verse 8. Yes, Moab, he rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. Then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses as your horses. Then he said, Which way shall we go up? And they had this whole conversation about how they should go and they should attack Moab. And it says that the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on a roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. So it all coincides, right? Like the king of Moab, he talks about how um, he had gone, he had fought against Israel. He he won against Israel. The Bible, it follows that same, the the same um, account up until that point. Now, it's interesting because the Moabite stone, it shares this these conquests, right? That um, the the king of Moab had against the the Israelites, but eventually on the Moabite stone, it says that the last few lines 
after it shares these these um, conquer these these conquests, all of the sudden it just stops. And it says the last lines are cracked and broken and they can't make out what these last lines said. Well, the reason for that is because the king of Moab was then conquered by by the Israelites. It, it was uh, quite a miraculous thing that happened. Um, so Misha, he's, he's telling these things. And what happens in scripture is uh, as this battle is coming together, the Israelites are coming to this final battle with the Moabites. And they're anticipating this this huge war and the Israelites, they, it seems like they're lost. But it is prophesied to them that not only would they not be lost, but that God was going to deliver them in a great way. And what ends up happening is the uh, in the morning, there's this God sends water and the um, the Moabites, they wake up and they believe that the Israelites have all killed each other and that the, the place is full of blood. And because they think that this whole place is full of blood, they decide that they're just going to go plunder. They think that the Israelites have just fought each other, right? They they got um, they had some kind of division. They fought each other. They've all killed each other. And now they've all fled uh, or have been killed. And so the Moabites, they go without even arming themselves. They walk out into this, uh, right into the Israelite camp. And the Israelites see them coming and they get up and they've got all their weapons. And the Moabites, they have nowhere to go. So the Israelites, they come in, they fight the Moabites, and they just slaughter them all. And they get killed, and the whole place is completely destroyed. Uh, they, they completely slaughter all of the Moabites. And I'll, I'll continue reading. This is verse 25. The Israelites, once they, once they defeated that main army, they just kept going. And it says, they destroyed the towns, and each man threw a stone on every good field until it was covered. They stopped up all the springs and cut down every good tree. Only Kir Hereseth was left with its stones in place. But the men armed with slings surrounded it and attacked it. When the king of Moab saw that the battle had gone against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but they failed. Then he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. The fury against Israel was great. They withdrew and returned to their own land. Now the story doesn't end there. If you remember, the Moabite stone says that it was Misha, who was the son of Chemosh, the Debonite, right? Well, after all of these things happen, after the, the king of Moab, after Misha was killed, uh, time went by, this stone was lost. Until 1868 in Debon, which is the exact place that he said that he was, where Misha said he was from. So in Debon, in this exact place, there happened to be a missionary by the name of F.A. Klein. And he had discovered this stone that seemed to be proving more biblical history, right? And there was a group of scholars that was searching for this evidence. So they send word to F.A. Klein and they ask him to tell them more about this stone that he had found that proves Bible history. Now, it turned into this whole dramatic thing because uh, Klein, he tried to go and get the, the Moabite stone transcribed. But for whatever reason, he sent a couple of people. The second person who ended up going angered the people who actually had the Moabite stone and they shattered it for some reason, which is why uh, it's been broken into all of these pieces. Even today, you can we'll get to that, but you can see it. It was broken into pieces for um, and they had to put it all back together because it was because of this. Uh, and so these fragments, they, they were um, sent all over the market to different people throughout this area of Debon. And these scholars and Klein, he had to go through and buy the different fragments from different people. Perhaps that was why they broke it up in the first place, right? Because they were trying to, they realized it was something valuable and they were trying to divide it amongst the people. And a person named Clermont Ganot was able to take this whole thing and reconstruct the stone. So after these archaeologists were able to put the stone back together, these scholars were able to study it, the stone was then protected and has since been protected. Right now it's in France in the, the Louvre Museum there where you can go and you can see it and in person, this incredible ancient stone that shows once again the accuracy, the historic evidence, the proof that the scriptures are what they say they are. They are the word of God and it is proven once again. And I'm always so excited to see these, these evidences of scripture. So I want to thank you for joining me for this episode and I hope to see you in the next one.